To kick off the second season of Don Bosco Stories this year, I was saving one of the most incredible dreams from his life. He and his boys are confronted with what sounds like the beatific vision and fall prostrate in front of God's blinding presence. It's a true humility check for all faithful Catholics. The Miracles and Prophecies of St. John Bosco, a project of America Needs Fatima. I'm your host, Matthew Miller. Subscribe for new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. These past few days, he began, while I was away, I had a very frightening dream. I went to bed one evening, thinking about the stranger who, as I told you a few nights ago, had taken me in a dream through the dormitories and with a lamp had shown me the boy's sins on their foreheads. While I was wondering whether he was a human like us or a spirit in human form, I fell asleep and immediately seemed to be carried back to the oratory. To my surprise, it was no longer here in Valdoco, but at the entrance of a valley long and wide, hemmed in between two lovely hills. I was with you, but you were all silent and tense. Suddenly the sun broke out, shining so strongly that we were forced to lower our heads. We remained in that position for some time until the blinding light dimmed almost to absolute darkness, making it difficult for us to see or recognize even those close to us. The sudden change was very frightening. As I tried to figure out what to do, a greenish light flashed at one corner of the valley and, streaming across it, formed a graceful rainbow between the two hills. The darkness receded, and from the rainbow, very similar to a rainbow after a heavy rainfall or the aurora borealis, multicolored beams of light streamed into the valley. While we were all intent on admiring and enjoying this charming spectacle, I noticed a phenomenon even more astounding at the far end of the valley, a gigantic electric globe hanging in midair, darting blinding flashes in all directions so that no one could look at it without the risk of falling to the ground in a daze. The globe kept floating down toward us, illuminating the valley more brilliantly than 10 of our suns could have done at full noon. As it drew nearer and nearer, the boys, blinded by its glare, dropped face to the ground, as if struck by lightning. At first, I too was terrified, but then getting hold of myself, I forced my eyes to gaze boldly upon the globe, following its movement until it stopped some 300 meters above our heads. Then I decided that I must see what sort of phenomenon it was. I scanned it thoroughly, and distant though it was, I could see that its summit had the shape of a large sphere and bore a huge inscription, the Almighty, it said. The whole globe was ringed by several tiers of balconies crowded with joyful, jubilant people, men and women, young and old, dressed in sparkling, indescribably beautiful garments of many colors. Their warm smiles and friendliness seemed to invite us to share their joy and triumph. From the center of this heavenly globe, countless shafts of light radiated, flashing so blindingly that any boys looking at them were stunned, staggered a moment, and then fell face down to the ground. I, too, unable to endure such brilliance any longer, exclaimed, O oh Lord, I beg you, either let this divine sight vanish or let me die, for I can no longer withstand such extraordinary beauty. Then I felt faint and I too dropped to the ground with the cry, let us invoke God's mercy. Coming to myself again, I stood up moments later and decided to tour the valley and see what had happened to the boys. To my great surprise and wonder, I saw that all were prostrate and motionless in prayer. In order to find out whether they were all dead or alive, I prodded several with my foot asking, what's the matter? Are you alive or dead? All gave me the same answer. I am imploring God's mercy. Then, to my deep sorrow, I came upon several, their faces black as coal, who kept gazing defiantly upon the globe, almost as if challenging God. I went up and called them by name, but they gave no sign of life. Paralyzed by the rays of light darting from the globe because of their obstinate refusal to fall prostrate and implore God's mercy with their companions, they had become as cold as ice. 
What grieved me even more was that they were so numerous. Just then, an abnormally huge, indescribably horrid monster rose up at the far end of the valley. Never had I seen anything as frightening as that. It strode toward us. I told all the boys to stand up, and they too were terrorized by the horrible sight. Gasping in anguish, I searched frantically for some Salesian to help me get the boys up the nearest hill for safety, but I could find no one. Meanwhile, the monster kept getting closer and closer. When it was about to overtake us, the brilliant globe, which until then had hovered over our heads, quickly dropped almost to the ground, shielding us from the monster. And at that moment, a voice thundered through the valley, nulla est convincio Christi cum Belial. No treaty is possible between Christ and Belial between the children of light and the children of darkness, that is, between the good and the bad, whom Holy Scripture calls the children of Belial. At these words, I awoke in a cold sweat. Although it was only midnight, I couldn't fall asleep again or feel warm the rest of the night. I was amply consoled at having seen almost all our boys humbly seek God's mercy and faithfully respond to his favors but I must admit my profound grief at the goodly number of proud, hard-hearted lads who rejected God's loving invitation and drew his chastisements upon themselves. I already summoned a few of these boys last night and others today so that they may soon make their peace with God and stop abusing his mercy and scandalizing their companions. There can be no alliance between God's children and the devil's followers. Nulla est convincio Christi cum Belial. This is their last warning. As you see, my dear boys, what I have told you is but a dream like all the others. Still, let us thank God for using this means to show us our spiritual condition. How generously he enlightens and favors those who humbly implore his help and assistance in material and spiritual need. Deus superbis resistit humilibus autem dat gratiam. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. According to Father Berto, Don Bosco didn't further elaborate on the details of the dream, but we can easily grasp the message. As long as we are in this valley of tears, God permits periods of light and darkness in our spiritual life, just as day alternates with night. Those who withstand the darkness and apparent abandonment humbly and trustingly soon see light return more brilliant than ever with a magnificent rainbow. Those instead who, full of themselves, neglect their spiritual life and are concerned only with earthly matters soon lose God's grace and repeatedly fall prey to the infernal monster who, like a roaring lion, endlessly roams about seeking to wrest souls from God. Humility and greatness go hand in hand, St. Augustine said, because the humble man is united with God. Humility doesn't consist in shabbiness of dress, speech, or demeanor, but in lying prostrate, mind, heart, and soul totally centered on God, with full awareness of one's nothingness in an endless plea for his mercy. Thank you all so much for watching. And if you'd like to see a playlist with all of the dreams of St. John Bosco that we've performed on this channel so far, just click on the link above me here. God bless you and Our Lady keep you. Happy New Year.